Yeah, I also want to thank Nim, Yonis and Elaine and all my new friends. I think like the last residency I was in was just when the pandemic hit. So I came out of it and then, or like kind of it ended and then it was like pandemic time. And I think like everyone that time was so unstable and difficult and everything changed that for me, it was also really a time to consider life. And one thing that is so beautiful about a residency is that you can just take, you know, a little step back and a perspective on what's just happened because you have a little bit of freedom, a little bit of time, a little bit of support. And so this is a really generous time for me to be here with two beautiful people, Yannis and Elaine, who have really, yeah, it feels like it's not a residency, but more like a little family, which it is, because if I come home late, they tell me that the light never turned on. So, <laughs> um, it's been really nice, yes. Um, it's also been a bit about like learning new perspectives, like learning how to see in a different direction, no longer looking into the past, but maybe into the future for myself. So it's like closing doors, opening new doors, etc. cetera. Um, I came here with a research proposal about cyclo cyclopsies, cyclops vision. I will explain this, but first I will talk um, a little bit about the background of my practice. You're very free to take a chair if you want to, but I also know that sometimes standing is nice. But there is chairs that you can even sit next to each other. Um, I have um, not exactly timed it. I did want to give you like a little introduction. I'm going to take the easy way out by just playing a little video first. It's a late, clear night during the winter of 2016. From the porch of my little cabin in the Mojave Desert, I observe strange lights in the air. They are floating there along the mountain rims, maybe 30 kilometers up north. And it's not the first time that there in the distance and above a simulation village that some named Little Baghdad, I see the military test their new strange flying machines. At night, I film the lights and record the unexplainable rumblings, the different forms of sound pollution in the otherwise quiet desert. And during the day, I drive around, exploring the space with my binoculars. I have read all of the few magazines in the cabin. They are issued by Cluey, the Center of Land Use Interpretation. The magazines feature several of the military outposts, ranging from nuclear test villages in Nevada to the USAF-51 aerial photo calibration targets. And it is then when I feel no longer like a lost visitor in the desert. The desert, the military and I are connected by our research in resolutions. This Google Maps screenshot depicts a slab of concrete displaying an original USA 51 resolution target, a two-dimensional optical artifact that was used for the development and calibration of aerial photography, following a measurement sometimes referred to as ground-resolved distance. The resolution of an aerial photograph can be described as G GRD is smaller than 5 meters, meaning that objects of a half a meter or larger can be detected or interpreted from the image in question. Smaller objects presumably will not be able to be resolved and are therefore non-interpretable. During a long Google Maps stumble session, I suddenly roll over the coordinates of one of the huge slabs of concrete and surprisingly, it's located rather close to me. It's a three hours drive northwest of the cabin, east of the Mojave base Fort Irwin. It's a pilgrimage that needs to be prepared. It's not clear if the dirt roads are leading to the lonesome decommissioned slab of concrete and if they are even maintained. But the slab of obsolete technology speaks to me. It's the first physical embodiment of my research.
Since about four years, I've been researching what resolutions are. And at this point, I define resolutions as a means to make things function, but also as a means to make other things not function. A resolution is not just a solution, it's also always a compromise. However, the normal user is only trained to work with the things that function and not to consider what is being compromised. In my recent research into resolutions, I've subdivided my practice into five major strands of resolution studies. Habit, material, genealogy, institution, and scale. And during my residency at CERN, I focused more on the issues of scale or scale and dimensions. So what does it mean to scale things? What happens when something exists outside the dimensions or system units of scale? At CERN, the scientists are aware, like nowhere else, that in order to distinguish something of significance from its background environment, we must first be able to perceive it. If it remains invisible, inaudible, intangible, it is indescribable and therefore unknowable, at least to most of us. With the discovery of the Higgs boson particle and the photography of a shadow of a black hole, the premises of unknowable have started to shift. Shadows of objects previously unregisterable for technology now start to be able to be captured. What fascinated me is how scientists stretch our normal dimensions and skills of measuring to capture the normally imperceivable, or how different skills of measuring we normally do not perceive, even become a main focus of research. In order to understand our life and the world around us, we need to learn to make space for knowledge of the imperceptible and the immeasurable. New knowledge is right there, in the tiny and huge scales around us. So, <clears throat> this was a video that I sent in to CERN for the residency. Uh, they were interested in looking into things that can normally not be seen shadow knowledge, I call it, and that's when I was invited actually to CERN. Um, it was also inspired by um, one of the objects that I found during my time in the Mojave Desert. This is a concentrated solar farm. It means that you have thousands of mirrors that point to a single source that captures all that light, gets heated up and produces energy from it. Um, what I, I saw it from very far away and I didn't know it was there. I saw this very big white light, right? And it attracted me, so I had to drive there like a fly. I went there and I opened the door of the car and I thought it would make a lot of noise, but in fact it was totally quiet. And so I was just looking at this white light that was just like, they call it the ray of death because it's that much energy. It just kills any bird or whatever that flies through it. Um, I looked at it and for me it was like the first time I felt like I really saw white. It was like beyond what I have ever experienced in my eyes. I cannot capture that on a video, but it's like, you know, it was a very special moment where you learn kind of the boundary of your own senses in a way. And so for me a lot of this is like learning to see, whether that's like with the optical device or whether it's like beyond your own knowledge of understanding, recognition, uh, if it's like learning that there is actually another window you can open and suddenly you have a totally new perspective. These are moments that I think you don't get very often, but they, are, they challenge your way in life, right? And so I collect them and I try to make sense of them and translate them into work. Um, <clears throat> one way is obviously something that we all learn, but I don't, I don't think I learned it in school is the problem. So it's been very inspiring me, for me to think through is that we as humans just see a very tiny slither of the electromagnetic frequency spectrum, meaning the color spectrum. Beyond that, there's a lot more, and we can see that with other devices, like with our radio devices or with an X-ray machine. Those are places that maybe other creatures, like trees or dolphins or, I don't know, um, can actually look at and see and experience. Just wanted to throw that out there that the way we consider like what is light and what is like color space is like something very pronounced to humans. 
from the work that I did at CERN, so being around these scientists, I uh, created a work which is called Whiteout. Whiteout is about a trip on the mountain while there was a snowstorm. Uh, we went to the mountain to come to the top of the mountain, the Brocken, which is um, a former Nazi base. There's still a big radio tower there. It was like a place that you could not reach back in the days. And we wanted to see if there is still stuff happening that is not really reported. So we went with loads of antennas and kind of like check if we could hear and see. Unfortunately, it was a snowstorm. It was quite cold. Um, you could really not see. And what happens in a snowstorm that is cold? All the batteries get depleted. So just for a little while, we could still, you know, play around. And then it became really about what is it to have everything, all the light you could imagine, all the noise in your eye and still not see, right? Um, that was on the mountain. And now here for the AMAP residency, I applied for a story inside a mountain. It's like kind of a diptych, although they're, you know, from different reasonings. And I applied with a work which is called About a Mountain that Refracts Light and Time. Um, the story I'm applying, I applied with comes from a longer family history. Um, this is uh, actually a map from Greece. You can see Athens there. This island is called Serifos. It's one of the Cyclades. Um, the tip of the island is called Kavos Kiklopas. There's also a little bit more to the east, uh, a mountain village, which is called Ramos. Uh, that's where my uncle lives already for about 30 years. So my mother and my uncle, her brother, are very close. She tries to see him. When I was young, we would go there every year, uh, to my almost annoyance. <laughs> but. Um, I have a good history with this island, a lot of like lovely memories. Um, it's a strange island. It's an island made for mining. It's an island that has uh, also mythological history. When you go there, um, it's like a Dutch would call it a cheese because they put all the holes to kind of like, they just blow stuff up to see what's happening there. So these are all holes, but it's not just like caves from blowing up stuff. It's also actual um, natural caves, right? So it's like a mix. And I am not used to that. I'm not used to mountains. I'm not used to like caves. I don't, I'm Dutch. We don't really have those things. We're just a flat country. Um, so it, was, it took me a little bit of time to understand that and to actually recognize it in a way. Like you can see a mountain, but to recognize that a mountain is more than just a mountain is something you need to learn. Like if you've seen more than one mountain, more than one type of mountain, you start to recognize them. But before that, it's just a mountain like the way you draw it in a children's book. So I needed to learn also to look at this island and to recognize what's on the island, let's say. Um, then I didn't go because I became 18. And I didn't have to go with my parents on a holiday. I could go wherever I wanted. So I just quit. And it's only like since mid-pandemic um, when we had that little break that uh, actually um, the founder and owner of the gallery that I'm with, which is Transfer Gallery, uh, Kalani Nicole, uh, she told me she was going to an island in Greece because an artist of her has a house there. And I'm like, oh, nice, where? She's like, oh, I'm going to Serifos. I'm like, so I had to come. So I came back to the island. And you have to imagine that from 18 to now 39, not being in the island, I saw the island with like, it was different. You know, you don't see it the same way. And suddenly the things that I was bored with back in the days, they just became so fascinating. Like the beach where my parents' family, uh, my, 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 uncle, everyone would like have their drinks in, a, in, the, in the, well, the whole Sunday long. <laughs> and I would have to wait before they were like finished drinking. It was the worst beach because it was ugly. 
It wasn't ugly. Suddenly, it was the most fascinating beach in the world. This is the view that you have. It is a cyclops throne on top, cyclops cave underneath. This is like really F, you know, the farming landscape. Big cave underneath and then the abandoned shacks. Now in Google Maps, they call them the baths. I don't know what they are. And suddenly I started to like, you know, at the Café Kiklops, by the way, I started to get really, really fascinated with this space that I deeply hate on Sundays, you know? It's because the sea had like the black stuff in it, so it wasn't the pretty, like everything there is pretty, but the one with the, the you know, the, the things that grow in the sea. So I started to talk with Spiros. Spiros is the owner of uh, the Kiklops, the wonderful man on the left and talk to him about cyclopses. Okay, that's his thing. Um, and I started to have questions. What do cyclopses see? Spiegels had no answers, by the way. He just knew that it was there and that's his cafe. But uh, on YouTube, this is from YouTube, uh, uh, a man called Lindy Beige has some theories about what cyclopses might be seeing. People say that the the perspective of a cyclops is flat because they have just one eye, but we all know that if we have like some type of impairment, we can often renegotiate, rewire, learn how to see things differently. And Lindbergh has seven options on how cyclopses see actually in depth. So one of them that I like, for instance, is that uh, the iris is on a stilt. And so while it looks with the one eye, the iris can like move and start to recognize depth. Uh, another one is to make like a, a beautiful flower iris. Seven more, you can watch them on the internet. I don't have to explain all his theories about Cyclops vision. <coughs> I started to announce and pronounce this and I got so many people that started to uh, write me uh, it started when I started to write my bios into Professional Cyclops Hunter because I thought maybe it would attract some information and it, I got a lot of random messages from people. Have you seen this? Have you seen that? So, you know, here's for instance uh, the famous um, Cypriot Cyclops in the middle. That's the dwarf elephant uh, found at the Souflaki spaces, I've heard. Um, next to the barbecues, the old barbecues. Um, they've all been eaten now, but they might have been one of the reasons why people believe in cyclopses is because, you know, the nose of the elephant has a big cavity, and so it looks like it could be a cyclops. Um, there was not a lot about cyclopses. Everybody knows what is a cyclops, but it's very hard to find the actual information about them. You have to ask the right people, and you have to have a little bit of luck. Um, one book that I did find that is a wonderful book because it's quite thick and you feel like you have the Bible on Cyclopses is this one, Cyclopses in Myth and Cultural History. But they actually start with, we wondered whether anyone had yet made a detailed study on the development uh, of cyclop Cyclopean myths from antiquity to today. And they discovered that there was not such a thing, so they just wrote it themselves. It's a nice book, but it's not, it doesn't give me all the information I was really looking for. Um, Wikipedia does its thing, you know, you get the information that there is indeed three tribes of cyclopses. There's the old tribe, the younger tribe, and then the tribe of um, the ones that are actual builders, which is nice. Now we have a timeline. They are also already a little bit pronounced over space, but it's still a little bit vague. So now I had to start really doing the research and I wrote to EMAP, and this is where I really got my professional credits. Months of cyclop hunting. Where to go, what to do. I have a map of cyclopean uh, traces and trails. All these black dots are actual moments of cyclops season history in space. Um, I'm not going to talk through all of them. I have selected some of my favorite examples, and we're starting in Greece. This is the throne of the cyclops. It's an archaeological site. 
It's quite old, eight meters wide. And from there, we go down the stairs to the cave, which is right underneath. And then to another cave, which is in mine. This is it from the site. They call this the throne of Polyphemus on the internet. Uh, it's been contested, so. And when you go there, I think it's a little bit hard to hear. You find that it's still rather active there. So there is something unknown. I asked uh, Spiros from Kiklopas, but he didn't know. So this remains a little bit of a mystery. The mine underneath has been um, deserted, I think, for about 50 years. Um, when you, I, I, I speeded this up because it's really, really big. Um, there's many, many mines, and some of them are bigger than others. Um, but I wanted to take you through it. I know this is annoying, it's too fast, but otherwise we don't get to the end, so we have to go faster. Um, it's really impressive when you go inside of it. It's cold, it's damp, it's humid. And when you get to a certain cavern, you will see it's made out of crystals. So many crystals. It really, it really touched me somehow, like that you can just go into a mine and then you suddenly you're walking around the crystals. All the space around it is blown up to pieces, but everywhere you have these beautiful special stones and uh, crystals that are like, you know, just hanging out basically. Um, I felt at that point, by the way, that I started to become a cyclop myself. Like, you start to become what you hunt. Um, the other part of uh, this particular verticality is the bats. This is, um, you have to climb there. I, uh, I tend to do things that are not necessarily smart, but fun. So this is me uh, that I climbed. And then when I came to the bats, I found that it was actually full of plastic. So we have this like weird verticality where you have the oldest history on top, the Cyclops throne, then we have a Cyclops cave, then we have a mine full of crystals, and then we get a plastic repository in the very low end. This just struck me as so such a weird upside down timeline. I collected the plastic in a big bag and thought I would bring it back to, um, the, to the trash. But that had some uh, results I will uh, talk about later. Um, okay, so the research went on. This is Adonis. Adonis is, the best people to talk with are the people that have a restaurant, right? Because they talk to many people, they know many people. Adonis is uh, also uh, an old friend. He used to be a cook in the Netherlands, so he even like took care of me as a child. So we are uh, good friends. Uh, Adonis knew a little bit about cyclopses and who to ask. He told me to go to Achilleas Gassis. Achilleas Gassis is the local surveyor and he should be knowing more about cyclops caves. There's one that I found, but there's another one that is mytholo mythologically. And Mr. Gassis said, yes, I have some kind of idea of where this could be. He sent me this red arrow, go there, around this place. It was really hard. These, these mountains, you will know it because you know mountains here, but um, just to be clear, like walking up a mountain to look for some cavity is not really fun because it's quite like, you have to really go over the bushy, nettly shit. It's not good. Um, so I decided to first ask the locals. This is um, Maria. She had heard of it and she put me, like she pointed like kind of in that direction, which was a little bit different from Mr. Gassi's because they're... I decided to just take a drone out and start to survey all the cavities from uh, above. And finally, I did find this one that is an actual natural 
space. And uh, I forgot to tell that here we have actually, it's a little bit small, Britain, but um, it says in the, in the text that it has been closed, the second, because it's too dangerous to get in. So I'm pretty sure that this is what they mean with closing up a dangerous cave. I feel like I found it. Yeah. Okay, so this is my mom. She's there, of course. Uh, my mom did her own due diligence. She was also interested in um, what we could find out about cyclopsies in the island. She heard about Polyphemus throwing the rock that later became Mikronisi, which is the island uh, on the coast, and found out that the Cyclops must have thrown the rock for seven kilometers from the throne. This is an interesting information because this is Mikronisi. It's, it's really quite far. I had to make footage, so I went there. But you have to really stand, like if you can see it from this uh, map, you have to really, um, it's hard to see there. This is like a little island. You have to go all the way on a place where you cannot drive. So you have to walk, walk, walk. So you can put the drone in the air and then, you know, film the rock that has been thrown, which is this thing. Um, I, I like that. It was a nice to film. Um, but what I realized is like when you go to an island, the actual part where you really don't come is also a special part for the infrastructure of the island. It's the trash belt. It's like they throw the trash there. So while filming this, I was, um, let's see if I can get there. I was all the way up here, all the way here. And here you start to see this beautiful, beautiful island being like kind of covered in plastic again. And this is when I started to realize that while I had just cleaned the plastic from the cave underneath the Cyclops cave, I had just put it inside, you know, a trash bin that they would just throw in here again and then would slowly go back to the sea. It's like never ending cycle of trash. Like you, you throw it in the trash, it goes back to the Cyclops bats and it's a lot and it's so bad like it looks almost pretty but it smells and there's oh it was really interesting so just as a reference started to think in how does this translate this is a work I saw uh, at the time in Athens it's by Thomas Hirschhorn it's a cave made out of plastic and it really struck me like I thought okay this is what it is the contemporary Cyclops cave is a cave of plastic so I'm starting to build plastic caves because in the end I will have to make a 3D space, right? So this is a plastic one. Um, I'm, start, I'm going to skip a few things because there's still a lot to talk about. This is another Cyclops Island. We're going to move to Italy. Always have to make Claudia sing for one moment. I read about the islands of the Cyclops in uh, Sicily, and uh, when I had to give a talk at the Internet Festival in Pisa, I just like went straight there after with the night train because that's a place that I had to go to. These are uh, what you see behind Claudia is um, it's a volcanic island. It's the Etna is right next to it, so the Etna kind of put the lava underneath and then it comes out and it goes into these like really beautiful hexagonal structures up. Um, when I arrived, I drove up to the islands and uh, got into my um, hotel and I told the, the owner, the exploiter of the hotel that I'm looking for cyclopsies and the first thing he said is, you have to go now to Bastiano. So this is my Bastiano. He brought me in this boat to the, to the this same like five minutes in. It was like very successful and I'm still very happy that Bastiano got me to the um, Cyclops Islands. This is the Cyclops Islands from the water. This is how they come up. It's so beautiful how the light is just filtered, right? Like here you're blue 
And then, bloom, we're in the golden hour. But this is like a place that is famous for cyclopses, and I started to find them everywhere. Actually, there is like a polyphemus library. Imagine that, like with a whole polyphemo shelf that has zero books about cyclopses. Um, and uh, a pizzeria, and I just, it, it became a little bit obscure. Um, I decided I should go and see the Etna, because the Etna is where uh, some of the three ancient cyclopses learned how to create thunder. And um, here we are on the Etna. It was a little bit of a, a hard day to get there, actually. I, you couldn't see much. Um, it was cold, and my car got stuck in the Etna. <laughs> it, was all, it was a little bit of a... An interesting experience. I want to move this one forward a little bit. It's what you get when you put a drone like uh, in the cold of uh, a volcano. She starts to become very um, temperamental and I had like a really interesting experience with this uh, particular drone where she started to make me all kinds of paintings from the mountain. It's really true that when you start to look for cyclopses, they are everywhere and you find them in everything and they just come to appear to you. And I'm hoping that you will also have this in the future because then you'll think of me all the time. <laughs> okay, moving on. From the Etna, a water bridge, uh, which is called Alcatera, uh, goes down, and this is like a very similar uh, hexagonal kind of landscape. Um, it's very beautiful. Okay, I moved too fast, it's fine. I'm starting to think like, okay, we've been now in Greece, where we have this like plastic cave, but what does Italy represent? It represents the older cyclopses to me. So here is where you really find this three thunder making, Cyclopses, and um, how does that translate? To me, that must be translated into uh, Buon Talenti. Uh, I don't know if any of you have noticed one, uh, these crottos, but if you ever make it to uh, Florence, this is so beautiful. It's like going to Limassol Beach and making like children's sculptures, but then seriously, it's, it's really, really, really nice. So I started to build them for the level of, for the old, old cyclopses. I'm gonna move on. Now, the final stretch. Are you still okay there? <laughs> Petros is dying. Okay. Um, cyclopses of Cyprus. Wow. Konos Beach. Who, who knows that there are Cy uh, Cyclopses in Connell's Beach. You know. Have you seen them? No, I had a boy on those. Oh, yeah? But it's a Russian. <laughs> I would love to have a poem about in Russian about Cyclopses. This is great. Um, okay, I went to the Cyclops cave on Connell's Beach. It's a little tiny. It's not so high, like what you would expect for a cyclops. It's also more like a toilet for people than an actual mythological space, I have to say. But I went in, full. I scanned the whole thing. This is a hard labor. And it's like also, again, becoming a cyclops because you're really like, with the LiDAR scanner, the, you're scanning the surfaces and you start to really see the space in a new way because you have to like, you know, collect the depth of the space. So I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm scanning it. Um, what is being reflected, it can like sense the distance and so it makes this 3D map with like textures over it. And so then I can take all my Cyclops caves home and put them in a 3D space and then tell the stories about them in there. A beautiful thing, you start to immediately also get a uh, kind of uh, acquainted with some of Cyprus's quirks, meaning military spaces, military pasts, 
not allowed to fly a drone, unfortunately. Um, started to look a little bit more in depth and if there was maybe more connections and yes, Cyprus has, for instance, the Cyclops Training Center, which is the Cyprus Center for Land, Open Seas and Port Security, whatever that means. Well, it is a non-military security and safety, including customs and exports control. I don't know what that means, but it's also about like cybersecurity and then to me it's immediate, immediately military, right? Like how can you say it's non-military but it's about cybersecurity? I don't know. Um, maybe, maybe yeah. it's, it's by the way all uh, financially um, made possible by the US. Let's be very clear about that. Start to think more, we of course have the beautiful Mount Olympus with the weather station that you're not allowed to photograph. So this is where you start to think, like I see stuff really coming back all the time. It is really about verticality, not just the mountain and time, but also about the way we have to look. Um, this is uh, the weather station, is also known as uh, Raf Trodos, which is, um, has a large history, I, I believe it was like, what is, let me just read it for you. Um, it is a remote signal station run by 27 people from the Gulf Department, the Common Service Signal Unit, and includes an Olympus radi radar station. The, the station is located in Trodos, la la la. Okay. Finally, rather close to Konos, uh, debatable what you mean close, is also Ayos Nicola Nicolaos, which is and then, you know, I'm starting to think in eyes and about new ways of seeing. We have the five member intelligence alliance um, by the five I countries, right? Just for you who are not familiar there, uh, right there. UK, the US, um, Canada, New Zealand and Australia. Nice group of people. Um, there, this particular one that's close to Famagusta is called Sounder, which I think is really nice because Sounder is like kind of this uh, reference to sound also, right? And so one of the cyclopses, the old cyclopses is called actually also sound, but in Greek, just thought it was like, I'm just seeing cyclopses at this point. Five eyes, just putting some references to alternative ways of fission. Like we know starfish have five eyes because they have eye on every pole, so they have like 360 vision, starting to think in different ways of seeing, maybe snakes seeing heat. Okay, what does that all mean? Like now I'm coming to a, a conclusion. This is like, whoa, what did she just do? This is all weird, okay. For 12 years, I've been working on, um, on, on work that features the Angel of History. The Angel of History is a painting by Paul Clay from 1940, um, bought by uh, Walter Benjamin a year later. And then Walter Benjamin wrote this beautiful text about the Angel of History, where she is being blown towards the future, but she can only see the past and everything that is destroyed in front of her, right? Like in her back, but what she's looking at. She can only see the past. I was thinking in these like different ways of seeing and different types of cyclopses. And then I remembered there is also, of course, Odin or Wodan. Wodan, you know, my mother does a project about Wodan's Eike. They are like these big trees and they're dying actually right now because our country is um, too dry. And so they're no longer putting fruits, but these are beautiful, beautiful trees. Like it's actually really close, this like Wodan. Uh, Wodan traded an eye to see his own demise. Okay, we can trade eyes now. What if the angel of history and Wodan would talk to each other and teach each other how to look? Then we could see the past and the demise. This is where I think the angel of history becomes a Janus figure. 
it can see and it can transition into spaces. Okay, so how do we build this? What, what is this world, <laughs> this weird work in progress gonna be? Like, okay, it's, it's like, let's go there. I'm going to uh, just one more, one, one shout out to my mom because she is always with me and the creature here, we're flying a drone. I think it's funny, but then, then she can go there. Okay, give me one more set. This is like really the work in progress. So it's gonna look not finished, it's a sketch. Disclaimers. Um, we will have something like this, where we will go through the bridge, Alcantara, Alcantara, sorry, um, which is the bridge from what you could also say is 80s, right? Like is the uh, the underworld Tartara, um, and then. This is all gonna have sound also, but we're we're still in a, a temporary moment. We go through my sand castle into the next level of. Oh, it dies. Yeah, but I have it here because I was smart to prepare. There. Into a cave that refracts light and time. where we have uh, a collapsed cave of Polyphemus, but also the actual um, mine. I can read you a little bit of the script, but I also feel like we're already 50 minutes in, so it's maybe like time for us to almost um, be done. At a rock pile that marks a specific place and time, the path forks. Left sits the collapsed cave of the Cyclops Polyphemus, which is where he kept Odysseus as a prisoner. And it's also where, of course, he blinded the Cyclops and escaped. To the right is an old mining cave. This is where I enter this mountain and where my thoughts get first triggered. Like I'm just gonna skip a little bit because otherwise it's gonna take too long. I'm gonna look around, that's what I'm gonna do. It's really hard to explain what I see here. When I look around me, it looks like I'm walking through a cave of broken crystals. In fact, I am actually in a cave of broken crystals. But it's hard to recognize because in this environment that has no lights, I cannot believe my eyes. These crystals are not behaving like a crystal is supposed to behave. A crystal cavern in the dark is not really a crystal cavern. It's a space that demands respect. And it does make me think of this video by Tommy Edison who's a YouTuber that has been blind since birth. In one of his videos about color, Tommy describes how it is impossible for him to see the color black because he simply cannot see. Therefore, it just doesn't mean anything to him. These crystals that have as their main aesthetic the refraction of light, they might never refract light ever in their existence makes me also wonder, maybe this is also an explanation, why we've never given names to the frequencies of light that we cannot see, why we've never given them color names. You can, of course, say infrared or ultraviolet, but those are not really the names of colors. X-ray is not a color, it's kind of like a technology and AM and FM are definitely not the names of colors. Then there's Bluetooth, which is kind of funny. And it also makes me wonder if rainbows could exist outside or beyond the infrared and ultraviolet color bands. I know that in 2014, the European Space Agency found a special glory on Venus. And that's because the atmosphere of Venus has a different consistency and so light refracts differently there. 
it, con it contains something like sulfuric acids. So this means that different frequencies of sunlight are filtered and are reached at the planet. Different forms of refraction occur and new rainbows and glories exist. I absolutely love rainbows. I believe they are the unexpected break of the flow of light in nature. So they are like nature's original glitch. I'm actually starting to keep rainbow report cards because I feel like we need to like really collect and talk about them more. Okay, let's reach the end of the cave or this mine. This was not an easy walk. <laughs> it's easier in VR <laughs> or in 3D. Um, but I will, I will go here. Wait. Yeah, I'm just gonna hope that this is gonna load. Yes, here we are. Okay. Um, this is gonna go really slow because I couldn't get the script to do it, but we'll just go here. This is uh, the final level that I haven't, uh, that I don't have a storyboard for, but it's where um, the angel of history finally will meet the Cyclops and really will learn how to look in the future. So just to speak about, give me one more minute, <laughs> how this is going to look like technically implemented, right? Because this is a sketch. It's gonna be a vertical experience. So we're going to go down backwards down, so we can never see what is happening. We can just see what we're passing. And then we're going through these different layers of space, so like uh, Alacantara or Tartara, then the, the plastic cave, no, the mine and then the plastic cave. And so from here in the plastic cave, slowly our perspective will grow and we'll start to be able to look forward as well. Um, so that's what I'm building. <coughs> Slow process because I had to do all the thinking first. <laughs> um, and I think I'm going to just leave it at that. Look at all, I have so much more text, it's amazing. Um, but I am very welcoming any remarks, questions, thoughts, criticism. This may be for email better, haha. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.